Chapter 3 After the adrenaline rush of Thomas Barton's arrest, the routine of the afternoon shift dragged on. Despite the neglected stack of paperwork calling for Jared's attention, he was too hyped to concentrate on writing reports. Distracted, he looked for any excuse to avoid the office. As daylight bled into evening, Brad and Jared patrolled the streets of Lockyer, propping local kids loitering in the shadows of the town square. Bored and disengaged, they wandered the streets in packs, waiting for trouble to find them. It was around 8pm when they decided to swing by the 24-hour BP roadhouse on the highway to pick up coffee and a bite to eat to get them through the rest of the shift. Jared's head thumped and he craved caffeine. They headed out of town, taking the highway turn-off and driving north. The dim glow from the green and yellow neon BP roadhouse sign cut through the darkness ahead. A vast blanket of low-hanging fog floated across the road. The town lights dipped beneath the horizon in Jared's rear vision mirror. He parked next to a large gas tank off to the side of the roadhouse cafe. "'How you doing tonight, gents?' said Carol, with a chubby grin, as they stepped inside. The automatic glass doors slid closed behind them with a whoosh. Brad headed towards the hot box. "'You'll make our night a whole lot better if you have some of those chunky beef pies. "'You're in luck, boys. Two coffees as usual?' "'You bet, darling. Nice and hot with two sugars in each,' flirted Brad. Carol gave a bashful smile and opened the hot box. Jared savoured the enticing aroma as she handed the pastries over the counter. Carol fired up the coffee machine, the hissing steamer frothing the milk just right. "'You boys stay safe now,' said Carol as she passed the takeaway coffee cups through the security wires. She waved Jared away as he held up the $20 note. "'You know it's on the house, boys. It's nice to have the coppers drop in on me from time to time when I'm out here on my own at night.' Your uniform mates were here just earlier. Makes me feel safe, you know, knowing you boys are out patrolling the streets. Well, thanks, Carol. You have a nice night and we'll see you soon. Jared discreetly tucked the $20 note behind the chewing gum stand for her to find later. They sat at their usual booth in the corner. Just as they finished eating, the handheld radio crackled to life. Any unit, any unit that can respond to a breakers on alarm at Kings for Drawer Supplies. Called Alan from Communications. Oh, shit, that's us. We're only five minutes away, said Brad eagerly. Oh, you're right Make the call. Jared didn't share the same enthusiasm. Brad raised the radio handset to his mouth. Oh, VKR, this is Sierra 501, Harding and O'Connor, responding from the BP Roadhouse North. Thank you, VO1. Show you proceeding code two. Any other units? The radio fell silent. As they made the dash out into the car park, Alan came back on air. No other units available. The other crew's still tied up at the DV job in town. Well, looks like it's just us, Jared said as they jumped back in the car. Coffee in one hand, he steered in reverse with the other and then jammed the stick into drive. Carol gave a smiling wave through the front console window as they skidded out the driveway. The gearbox dropped a gear and the engine roared as they hurtled back towards town along the empty highway. Kingsford's Rural Supplies was not far from the highway exit leading back into the outskirts of town. They passed a plant hire business, tractor and farm machinery sale yard and various warehouses. Up ahead, the rural supplies building stood out, the largest in the entire industrial estate. It was no more than a monstrous navy blue tin shed, but a favourite of locals for purchasing stock feed, irrigation supplies, fertiliser and horse riding gear. A bright floodlight shone skywards from a garden, illuminating the bold white lettering of the front signage. Moths and bugs flitted in and out of the yellow beam. As Jared and Brad approached, their attention was drawn to the flickering of torchlights inside the glass doors of the reception area. Our bastards are still inside, Jared said, steering the car into the driveway. He skidded to a halt with the headlights illuminating the reception area. Brad unclipped the radio handset and spoke into it with urgency. VKR 501 off job. Confirm breakers on and we'll be on foot on a handheld. (coughs) They grabbed their torches and jumped from the car. Jared was momentarily blinded by the reflection of the headlights in the windows. The high-pitched shriek of the alarm was deafening. Oh, they're still locked, said Brad, pulling at the door handles. Inside, two hooded figures scurried away from the headlights, their torchlights swallowed by the darkness. Jared pressed his face against the glass. Oh shit, they're heading for the back door. He turned on his heels towards the rear of the building. He flicked on his torch, the beam of light boring into the darkness to guide his path. His shoes slipped on the dewy grass. He regained his footing and turned the corner with Brad a few steps behind. The back door flung open 
and under the dim glow of the emergency exit sign, two small figures, backpacks over shoulders, leapt outside. A childlike voice squealed. Come on, run! Jared couldn't tell if it was a boy or girl. This is the police. Don't make me chase you, you little pricks, he yelled. He shone his torch in their direction, but could only make out their dark hoodies and baggy camo shorts. They took off, disappearing into a thicket of spindly grass. Jared honed in on the spot where the grass had been trampled, and he followed into the dark unknown. His shoes slid out from under him and he began to fall, seemingly in slow motion. The torch dropped as he braced for the landing. He fell heavily onto his backside and rolled down the embankment of a small creek meandering behind the industrial buildings. Brad's torchlight shone from behind, and Jared saw the silhouette of two miniature figures scampering across the creek and up the opposite slope. His torch rolled into the water and died. Oh, bloody waterproof my ass," he muttered. He dragged himself up and stepped into the cold, trickling water, his shoes sinking into the muddy creek bed. Brad slid down the slope, managing to stay upright. He arrived shoulder to shoulder with Jared and shone his light across the creek. But the kids were gone, slipping away into the darkness. Oh shit, fucking hell, Jared spat in frustration. Oh, little bastards were like gazelles. Brad bent over with his hands on his knees, panting to catch his breath. Oh, they're gone, Jared. We'll never catch them. Jared prized his shoes from the boggy creek bed and shook the water and mud off. Ugh. Come on, mate. Let's head back. Oh, hold on, said Brad. I'm just trying to keep that meat pie down. Oh, at yeah, times like this, I wish we had our own dog squad unit, said Jared. They won't send a dog unit all the way out from the city for a shitty juvie break and enter. No, agreed Brad. Those boys got their hands full with all kinds of major shit going down in the city. They were on their own and the trail was cold, so they headed back to the warehouse to inspect the premises. I'd say this is how the little monkeys got in, said Brad shining his torch on a large panel of steel mesh used for reinforcing concrete slabs. It was leaning up against the side of the building, and the grid pattern created a perfect climbing ladder. Yeah, look up there. Looks like that window up in the loft's been forced open, Jared said, still catching his breath. The steel back door creaked, left partially ajar as the little thieves made their escape. Brad pushed the door open with his torch. They just had to push on this emergency release bar to open it from the inside. Might have left some good prints on it, though. Yeah, we'll, we'll get Larry to come out first thing in the morning to run the print brush over. They stepped inside and shone their torches around, but the screeching alarm was unbearable. They went back out to the car and gave a sit rep over the radio, asking for the key holder to be contacted. It didn't take long for Gary Jansen, the store manager, to arrive, and they were grateful when he deactivated the alarm. As the final wail of the alarm echoed off the tin walls, the residual silence was deafening. The only sound that could be heard was restless pigeons shuffling about in the roof cavity. The huge warehouse, lined with long rows of shelves of produce, was otherwise eerily quiet. They turned on all the lights to inspect the premises. Apart from the forced window up in the storage loft, nothing else appeared disturbed or stolen. Gary went upstairs and secured the window. Brad followed and looked around the loft before they met Jared downstairs again. Jared took details for the report, and Gary reset the alarm as they exited. As Jared was handing Gary his business card, they all simultaneously jumped with a fright as the alarm began shrieking. Oh, that's strange, yelled Gary over the top of the racket. These alarms are activated by motion sensors. They're pretty reliable and only go off if there's a decent amount of movement detected. Otherwise, they'd be going off all the time from bloody rodents and possums. We'd better check it out. Do you mind, Gary? Jared asked apologetically. Yeah, no probs. I'm sure I reset it properly, but I better check. I'll need to get back inside to reset manually anyway. After finding the right key from a huge bunch on a steel ring, Gary pulled open the front sliding glass door and flicked on the light switch in the reception area. He keyed in the code, and the alarm fell silent once again. They stood inside and listened. Jared heard movement up in the loft, a subtle shuffling of feet. Did you hear that? He said. Then a loud clang as something heavy crashed onto the floor up above. I heard that, said Brad. Gary, get all the lights. Light this place up, Jared instructed. As the fluorescent light bulbs flickered to life around the huge warehouse, Brad and Jared made for the staircase. Jared called back to Gary. Stay there. He bounded up the stairs in his wet shoes, Brad on his heels. As the loft lights came on, a tiny figure darted out from behind a stack of crates and raced to the window.